Professor Steve Rowe. I'm a real paleontologist and you're watching Real Paleontology. And today in my Paleobite series, we're going to start with a quote. A famous dead dude called Napoleon Bonaparte once said, give me a man with a good allowance of nose. When I want any good head work done, I choose a man with a long nose. Now, if this quote is genuine, then if he'd had the chance, Napoleon's Grand Armée would have been run by Neanderthals. Because if we're talking humans with the biggest, longest noses, then we're definitely talking Neanderthal. And this gives me an obviously contrived segue into today's episode. Believe it or not, this is a question that's perplexed scientists for decades. Aside from their very prominent brow ridges, it may well indeed be their most striking facial feature. And this big nose is accompanied by a suite of related features. Compared to modern humans, the Neanderthal's nasal opening was very tall and wide, and the middle of their faces were long and projected forward, as you can see in this figure here. We call this forward projection prognathism. Anyway, these are questions that have intrigued me and some of my colleagues too. And in 2018, we published this paper, wherein we use computer modeling to address it. So we're obviously going to talk about this paper and a few others as well. But a quick bit of backstory first. Neanderthals were a pretty wide ranging Northern Hemisphere human species that split away from our own somewhere between around 800,000 and 315,000 years ago. They persisted through multiple glacial events, periods through which it got very damn cold and dry in their part of the world. So it's hardly surprising that some have explained this distinctive facial shape as an adaption to a cold, arid climate. Another common explanation is that this big nose and prognathic face are adaptations to resist high bite forces at their front teeth. This ties in with the fact that many Neanderthals have been found with heavily worn anterior dentitions, which in turn has been interpreted as a consequence of using their front teeth as tools, basically as a third hand to hold objects whilst manipulating them with the other two, tasks like preparing skinned hides. A further alternative explanation is that it's just genetic drift, basically a random process with no obvious evolutionary advantage or disadvantage. Now, there's a ton of literature out there addressing this big nose question, and it would take days to review it all. But I can say that until we published our 2018 paper, no one had comprehensively addressed these questions using 3D computer simulation. The paper is freely downloadable here, and much of the previous literature is cited therein. So, what did we do in our study, and what did we find? Well, the first step, of course, was to build 3D computer skull models. We built a bunch of models of modern humans from all over the world, all based on CT scans. These included skulls of recent hunter-gatherers, as well as people of European, Asian and African descent. We also included the fossil skull of a late Ice Age modern human. We did this to determine whether Neanderthals might have at least in part overlapped in their facial anatomy with we Homo sapiens. Can't be too careful. This was all relatively straightforward. We then built models of three Neanderthal skulls and another fossil human species, Homo heidelbergensis. Many believe that heidelbergensis is the common ancestor of both us and the Neanderthals. But even if it's not, it most likely looks a lot like our common ancestor. We needed to do this to determine whether or not, or to what degree, we and Neanderthals diverged from the ancestral state. Now, building 3D models of our fossil specimens was definitely not straightforward. This is because although we had CT scans for the most complete fossil specimens available, all were missing at least some parts of their skulls. To address this, we performed something called a warping operation. When I say we, I mean a brilliant young colleague of mine, Dr. Will Parr here. I first worked with Will back in 2011 when we got funding for him to visit my lab from the UK. And I'm so glad he did because I don't reckon there's anyone in the world with the smarts to do this as well as he did. 
How did he do it? Well, frankly, the details of the math and the programming are beyond me. But in short, he placed hundreds of what we call landmarks on both the exterior and interior surfaces of a complete human skull, as well as our fossil skulls. He then warped the modern human to fit the existing anatomy of the fossil skulls. Now, importantly, this does not result in some sort of hybrid mix between the modern human and the fossil. As long as you've got a reasonable amount of anatomy in the fossil, the result is an accurate representation of what the fossil would have actually looked like, not some kind of intermediate chimera. And we'll prove that. Anyway, with our models built, we had what we needed to perform two separate analyses. One comparing the mechanics of biting between our Neanderthals, modern humans, and our Homo heidelbergensis, and the other to compare airflow through the nasal passages in the three species. For our biting simulations, we used a method called finite element analysis. This approach was first developed for the aerospace industry in the middle of last century. It allows us to simulate the properties of bone in our models and then apply muscle forces so that we could compare the ways in which stress and strain developed. It also allows us to accurately predict bite forces. In these models, cool colours, such as blue, indicate low stress and increasingly hotter colours indicate high stress. So, what did we find? Well, we found that there was bugger all difference. By and large, modern humans could bite just as hard as either Neanderthals or our Homo heidelbergensis, and they did this without developing any more stress in their skulls. Obviously, this is at odds with the theory that the Neanderthal's characteristic nose and facial anatomy evolved to resist big biting loads. And more recent analyses have been in broad agreement. In this 2024 paper by Najasida and colleagues, they found that the front teeth of Neanderthals were no better adapted to take high bite forces than those of modern humans. For our second analysis, comparing airflow through the nasal passages, we used something called computational fluid dynamics, another computer-based approach first put to practical use in the aerospace industry. This allowed us to estimate the volume of air that could pass through the nasal passage, the degree to which that air could be warmed before it entered the lungs, and the amount of moisture that could be recovered. And again, when I say we, here I mean another clever young guy who had previously visited my lab, Dr. Jason Burke. Jason took Will's reconstructed models and performed the fluid dynamics. What did Jason find? He found that the Neanderthal's nasal passage was indeed much better at warming and dehumidifying cold air than ours. He also found that the Neanderthal could move much more air much more quickly through its nasal passage than we can. Interestingly, results also showed that Homo heidelbergensis, representing morphology ancestral to both Neanderthals and Homo sapiens, performed less well than the Neanderthals, but better than we modern humans. This suggests that both we and Neanderthals evolved in opposite directions away from the ancestral state. So, Neanderthals got better at conditioning large volumes of air through their nasal passages, and we got worse. And obviously our analyses clearly support the theory that the Neanderthal's big nose and long forward projecting face represent adaptations to cold, dry conditions. It also contradicts the genetic drift hypothesis by demonstrating that there is a clear evolutionary advantage to having a whopping big nose and pragmatic face if you live in a cold climate. This begs the question, just how much of an evolutionary advantage did this big nose give our Neanderthal cousins? Well, it turns out there are many advantages. The most obvious is that it warms and humidifies air before it gets to the lungs way more effectively than breathing through the mouth, and it conserves water. But nose breathing is also far more effective at filtering out bacteria and viruses. It activates the part of the nervous system that supports rest, recovery and digestion, and it reduces the incidence of bad breath, cavities and gingivitis, to name but a few. Bottom line is that the Neanderthal's enhanced capacity to breathe through his nose meant that they could participate in high energy activities for longer and harder. And they could do this without resorting to mouth breathing and suffering 
the many associated disadvantages that go with it. The ability to conserve water during long persistent pursuit of prey animals may have been particularly important. This brings us to an interesting very recent discovery. Just last year, Quing Li and colleagues showed that some modern human noses have gotten taller as a result of inheriting a particular gene from Neanderthals, particularly East Asians that are thought to be better adapted to the cold than most other Homo sapiens. But it's important to note that while there are a fortunate few of we modern humans that sport a generous allowance of nose, unfortunately, no modern human exhibits anything like the awesome facial and nasal morphology of the Neanderthal. And finally, to a last truly vexed and long-standing question. How and why did most modern humans tragically wind up with such stupid, absurdly short little noses and tiny little faces in the first place? I will address this in a later episode. I hope you enjoyed this one, and if you did, then please like and subscribe and enjoy the rest of your day or night.